John Bichtenstein is a well-known winemaker, wine educator, and Rhone Ranger here in California. He's going to be discussing vinification schemes for the productions of rosé with Rhone varietals today. John's worked for several well-known wineries, including Joseph Phelps Vineyard and Fife Vineyard. He's the past president of the American Society for Enology and Viticulture, a very important um, nonprofit organization which promotes research. He's currently winemaker and general manager for Sauvignon Republic. John regularly teaches in the wine program for the Culinary Institute of America at Greystone in the Napa Valley, and also for UC Davis Extension, where he is one of our most popular instructors. And so I'd like all of you to welcome John and his elaboration of rosé. They put a Stairmaster on here so I can... <laughs> okay. Just a quick clerical uh, thing. Um, I don't have Wayne Farquhar's excuse of uh, having to wait till I was on the plane to c collect my data and I did mine last night or I finished it last night, but you should all have a copy of this uh, PowerPoint at your place. And uh, also a tasting sheet that, that is at this point blind to you, at least the name of the producer and so forth is blind. And uh, at the end I'll hand out a sheet that has the identity of everything. Well, it is super nice to be here. Um, over the years, we've done a lot of uh, Roan class classes, but not for a while now. And so I was just thrilled that uh, that Deborah decided to put this group together. Um, it's been a few years since I've seen uh, Francois Perrin and, and uh, Robert Haas, and not to mention uh, many many other distinguished speakers here today. And I think I recognize about half the faces in the audience, so at least I'll know where the snide comments and the tricky questions are going to come from. So when Deborah asked me if I would speak about rosé, or about the Rhone, or grapes of the Rhone, I said, no. <laughs> and she said, oh, come on. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm currently uh, a Rhone winemaker without portfolio, which means that I'm working with... <clears throat> uh, Sorry, uh, sorry, Remington, I'm working with Sauvignon Blanc at, at the present time. But um, uh, in, years ago, uh, the rosés of Tavel and the south of France captured, captured my spirit. And uh, not long after that, the reds of the Rhone captured my soul. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty stuck. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also recidivistic, so someday I will... I'm sure I will be once again a, a, a Rhone or Rhone grape winemaker. Uh, today, though, um, uh, I am without portfolio, and so I insisted that if if I were asked to talk, that I would talk about rosé. And I, fortunately, it's a relief. I don't have to talk about the grapes that much. Uh, I will a little bit, but... You've already heard about all of the grapes involved and uh, how to grow them and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the elaboration of rosé. Uh, in other words, some of the schemes, the simple schemes that are used to bring the grapes to vinification in, in the Rhone and then specifically in Tavel. That was my original title. Uh, Deborah, in a, in a fit of uh, fancy... Uh, Flight of Fancy decided that my talk would be called a rosé by any other name. So, there we go. Um, in addition to being a, a, a roanless winemaker, at least at the moment, I'm also a, a baby boomer uh, who's <clears throat> whose generation had uh, painful memories of the rosés through which we used to suffer. 
year, years and years ago, um, I won't tell you how we improved on their chemistry during the years that I went to Berkeley, but, but they needed some improvement. And, uh, uh, and, and I'm much the same as many North Americans who, who grew up during that era um, and who, who now love rosé because we have gone to the home of many wonderful traditional role models for rosé and we've been won over by the context. We've been, uh, we've sipped cool rosé, looking at the beautiful Mediterranean, eating, eating grilled shrimp and tapenade and what have you. And then we come back home and we want to repeat the experience and we can't, or we couldn't. Now we can, uh, because so many people, like-minded people are making wonderful rosés here. Rosés uh, appear to have been, t to be made in many places in the world uh, using uh, what is the vin de base, the, the plentiful blending wine, whatever is, is available there. In the, Loire, in the middle of Loire, it's Cabernet Franc. In, uh, in Italy, what's the most widely planted grape around Italy? Sangiovese, right? So Sangiovese Rosato. What's the most plentiful grape or one of the most plentiful grapes in the southern Rhone? Uh, Grenache, uh, among others, of course. And uh, in California, Zinfandel and Barbera were very, very heavily planted over the years. So we make alternate products out of grapes that are otherwise plentiful to us or that form the basis for uh, other blends that we make. Uh, Jancis Robinson reminds us of what I just told you, that we uh, in the New World, and particularly Northern Hemisphere New World, are in general uh, rather bemused by the whole concept of rosé. and. Um, it's interesting, um, pouring rosé at tastings over the years has been a lot like um, uh, guerrilla warfare. You sort of have to pop up and force people to do your bidding and then leave and hope you leave a good impression. We actually, um, when I uh, would, would pour at a tasting, I, I thought I'd give you the numbers on that. I call it my period of rosé proselytization. Uh, trying to convince people that in spite of what they tasted in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, that they, would, that they did like rosé. So a, tip, a cross section um, of people that would come by my booth, uh, everyone would refuse to taste rosé. Some would say, oh, I'm on whites now. Or, or I've already done whites, I'm on to reds, I don't want to backtrack. So in fact, I would reach over the table, grab them by the necktie or the lapel and say, you're not leaving until you taste rosé. And so uh, out of every uh, 10 people, there was one who I could tell really didn't like it. That's okay, one's not bad. Uh, there were also um, another two uh, tasters who committed what we used to call the error of indulgence. In other words, they lie to your face it's when someone loves a wine in the presence of the winemaker. Uh, uh, so that leaves us with seven. And I'm convinced over the years that a properly presented dry rosé made from Rhone varietals was, was actually uh, loved by those seven people who were converted, which is why we have a prayer of selling rosé. Um, and rosé has really taken off. If you go in any of the shops now, uh, they're loaded with rosés. It's the time of year. Uh, a lot of O5s are already uh, are already in the shops. My first um, my first uh, academic introduction to rosé uh, was at UC Davis. And uh, did I see Ramy here somewhere? There you are. Hi, David. David may have been in this lecture with me. We had, uh, we, we, we had a series, uh, 198s or whatever they were called, where uh, guest winemakers came from industry to talk to us. And we, we, we invited people from all segments of the industry. And so for this one particular talk, we had uh, John Franzia Jr. as our winemaker speaker. And uh, he spent the better part of an hour telling us uh, how he made red wine and the red wine program and the white wine program. And in those days, a lot of continuous screw presses and a lot of heavy duty force the son of a gun through the system and get it bottled type of thing. But at the end of the class, somebody, I don't know, maybe it was Dave Ramey, maybe it was me, maybe it was 
one of our other unlucky classmates, raised their hand and said, but Mr. Franzia, I, I, I've seen in the stores that you make a rosé. What about your rosé program? And he said, well, you got your white wine moving on down. You got your red wine moving on down. And every once in a while, they meet. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. There's been a, other, other than that, there's been a lot of other confusion over the years about rosé. And uh, uh, my friend uh, Professor Mayberry mentions uh, just a couple of the half-truths about rosé, namely that rosé is both red and white, and it goes with any food. It's sort of a simple uh, sommelier secret uh, to try to get you to like rosé. And then the other one is that rosé is neither red nor white in it, it, because it's confused. It can't make up its mind. So um, I say that rosé actually is a third type. It's a bona fide third type. And yes, it does share, share elements with both reds and with whites. Um, historical and anecdotal evidence, and not to mention sort of common sense hindsight, uh, shows us every indication that rosé production arose for a couple of reasons. One was the need to justify the style of wines that were made locally in certain parts of the world um, because perhaps they were lighter. And another one is the, the need to make a usable product from a byproduct. The byproduct being the juice that was bled off so that the remaining red wine making in the tank could have a higher skin to juice ratio. Uh, what do you do with the stuff you drew off? You got to make something out of it. You can't waste it. So uh, in that sense, uh, the early rosés may have been a, a silk purse, um, but uh, in, in really hot regions with varieties with lower color, they make wonderful rosés, but people felt the, felt the need to justify it. In fact, um, in, the, in the really early days, this is uh, thanks to a quote from uh, a paper done in 1974, uh, a little over about 100 years ago, um, in Tavel, uh, the, the local literature said that the fine wines of Tavel are of a pretty color, clear golden ruby, with very lively and not rosés, they emphasized. Rich, uh, nuance of topaz mixed with ruby, sparkling in the glass. Look, they were surrounded by wonderful red wines. I'm sure people had an inferiority complex about the lighter nature of some of their wines, and so they had to convince you that they were not reds. Well, that they were not rosés, that they were reds. Well, eventually, of course, uh, uh, people got over that and started to strut their stuff and uh, finally realized that it was okay to be rosé. And they had all the wonderful, wonderful varieties to use. So uh, Tavel, in particular, is not a varietal wine, as you know, uh, but is an assemblage or it's a, a blend wine. Uh, of many different cepages, many different varietals, with balance as a goal. And balance is often diff difficult to achieve um, uh, with just a couple of varietals, so you can use many varietals, which uh, in one year, one might give you more, another one might give you less, and uh, each varietal has something to bring to the party. So what were those varietals? Let's have a look. Uh, were and are. Uh, you've seen these already today, Grenache, Sanceau, uh, Claret, the, the white Claret Blanche. Uh, there is a Claret Rose. I have not tasted that separately. Picpoul, uh, Bourboulon, Mourvedre, Syrah, and Carignan. Uh, just some miscellaneous regulations that I threw up. These are from the little older days. Perhaps uh, they've changed a little. Uh, minimum 15% senso required. I'm happy to see that more people are using a little more senso these days. Um, no other variety may exceed 60%, uh, and that 60% in, in the former days was often taken up by Grenache. Uh, Carignan restricted to 10. Um, the production, um, uh, maybe Francois has a, knows a different number, but I was told by, uh, I think it was uh, Vincent de Bez or somebody, that, that uh, it's, it's limited to 35 hectoliters per hectare. But in a good year, one can apply for permission to make a little more, 20% more, which uh, results in about 42 hectoliters per hectare. For those of you who need a conversion, 
a very rough rule of thumb conversion is that uh, 15 hectoliters per hectare is about a ton per acre. So in 35, you're a little over two tons to the acre. In 42, you're not quite three tons to the acre. So the production is kept, is kept uh, low. Um, and note, these refer to the percentages in a plantation. And actually, they can be uh, uh, a bit different in blends. So there are two basic methods of, uh, of rosé vinification. I said in Tavel, but I should have said kind of in general uh, in the world, two general methods. Uh, one is direct press, where grapes or uh, either whole cluster or otherwise go directly, go directly to press, and uh, depending on the length of the press cycle and the amount of time and the amount of uh, crushing of the berries, uh, a, a more or less uh, a, a blush de noir comes out of the press. Uh, and that's used uh, more, I think, in uh, Provence as the, st as the style than in, uh, in Tavel. Another one is uh, Seigné, uh, Partiel de la Cuve, um, where some juice is drawn off, um, of course, in Tavel, where to be called a Tavel, it must be a rosé. And, and uh, uh, then, then all, all of the material is used, as we'll see in a moment. But this is just uh, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the region. So just to have a look at these first, these uh, two general methods, um, whole clusters or clusters that have been destemmed only or clusters that have been destemmed and crushed are delivered directly to press. Uh, juice is collected in a settling tank, racked to a fermenter, and that's your starting material for rosé. In, uh, of course, the implications of this are very, very brief skin contact time, hence low color. Uh, press hold is used to regulate. If you want a little more extraction, um, the material sits in the press longer. If you have a modern pneumatic press, you can cap the, uh, the discharge valves and, and leave it there. You could even rotate it a few times. Um, better uh, the... Um, um, it's, it's easier um, to deal with the grapes this way because the, what I mean by the next line is the, the juice is easier to chill than, our, than entire grapes. Uh, when you crush or, or even when you dump whole grapes into a tank, you can't get good heat penetration. So ju juice is better for chilling is how that should read. Uh, and this method is widely used in the Cote de Provence. Um, boy, I don't, that looks strange in color. Do those look pink and red to you from your, from your angle? Okay, well, on the screen up here, the left one is a very, very faint, uh, kind of a uh, coppery pink color. That would be the re that's the result of pressurage direct, and the one on the right is uh, more of a of a uh, light light ruby pink color, and that's one that's had some maceration time. Those look strange up there. I know I noticed that uh, Wayne's some of Wayne's colors were the grapes were blue, the leaves were blue. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's the direction I wanted to take you on that slide. So um, the second method, the second general method is when uh, grapes are delivered in uh, one fashion or another to the fermenter and then um, juice, is, juice is pulled off after a period of contact, after a period of maceration. Juice is pulled off, uh, allowed to settle and then fermented into rosé and the remaining juice stays in the tank uh, and is fermented as a red wine and yields and yields red. So this would be the the uh, old time situation where this uh, saigne or this drawing off or this bleeding off of juice was used to enrich the contents of the tank that remained behind. And I showed you that picture again to give you the same weird message. So my friend Professor Mayberry actually has a real nice uh, scheme. Uh, in his book, uh, Wines of the Rhone Valley. And so I'm going to follow that to today to talk about kind of the three types of juices that uh, can be made that can go into a Tavel blend. The first one is juice A, and this is essentially the, the, the pressurage direct, um, where, where either whole, the clusters are either uh, dumped whole to press whether they're 
destemmed, in which case a high percentage of whole berries remains, or whether they're destemmed and put through a roller crusher, direct to press, settling tank, fermenter, and so forth. So this would produce a juice of lighter tannin extraction, lighter color, uh, maybe, maybe fresher, uh, lightweight juice. Juice B actually has different variations uh, on a theme. Um, you can crush with no destem. You can use a gentle, uh, well, it's not that gentle, but you can use a solids pump. Um, is that called a pompe olive? Pompe à l'olive? Pompe à l'olive. Um, referring to a pump that's used to pump olives. You don't want to cut the olives up, but you want to deliver them whole. I think I saw that at an ASEV conference one time where they were pumping goldfish. Uh, pretend goldfish, and and they survived. The pretend goldfish survived, uh, but but they're fairly they're fairly gentle. So there's a little tiny bit of crushing going on, uh, but no destemming. Partial crush may be run through a crusher, but with the with the rollers or the knurled rollers set far apart, so that there's only minimal crowding at the door. Uh, some producers tell me that they they use uh, a delta or a similar uh, crusher destemmer but they use it for destem only with the, with the rollers pulled out of the way. And others say, oh no, we just do normal, we, we destem and we crush and, uh, and deliver right to the maceration tank. This is the situation where it's difficult to cool and has to be watched very, very carefully because um, <clears throat> depending on te temperature, extraction may be happening very, very quickly and uh, at some point you have to decide when to draw off your juice. This juice is then uh, drawn off and uh, uh, allowed to settle, transferred to a fermenter and on to rosé. Uh, the, the rest of the skins are put to press. This is the Tavel situation. Okay, now juice C is what happens to that juice after saigné, the rest of the juice that's in the tank. Um, it's come out of, it's put to, put to press, uh, pressed, but pressed gently, uh, maybe um, typically no more than a modern a modern uh, pneumatic press would uh, would give you um, <clears throat> to a settling tank, and then a decision may be made: Do we want to put this back in with our parsenie juice, uh, or do we want to keep it separate? And very often, the richness of the wines of Tavel. Uh, lies in the fact that much of that juice C is used. In fact, the rosés of Tavel tr traditionally use juice B and some form of juice B and juice C as their primary juices. And uh, juice A is used as a blend back. If uh, a wine needs a little more finesse um, uh, or a little lightening up or, or what have you. Finesse, uh, finesse means, uh, translates more as, uh, as a lightening up or a softening up or a putting something in that is less in some component that will absorb the excesses of that component in the other components that are in the blend. So you can see that if you have, uh, of, a, of a juice that's rich in sugar and, uh, but lean in color and tannins, uh, it will help you dilute out the, the, the B juice or the C juice that's stronger in tannins. Um, so most classic Tavels, and indeed one that we're going to taste today is uh, B plus C, but so, and some are made from A only, and some use a little bit of A for, uh, for blending. The different cepages used are uh, Grenache. Grenache is... Uh, in, in, in Chateauneuf, Grenache is the Vin de Bas, used at a fairly high percentage. Um, but uh, in this case, it's used. Um, these are fully ripe grapes, by the way. These are not early picked uh, Rosato style. These are complete, full, full sugared, making a full alcohol wine. Senso uh, is also a Vin de Bas. It's also used for finesse. Senso uh, oftentimes doesn't get much darker than flame seedless. It's a uh, very fairly light skin, very large, very large berry with a low skin to juice ratio. So it always, uh, it, it's always a, more of a, a subtle wine. 
uh, clarette blanche for finesse, uh, clarette rose sometimes in pig pool and bourbonnac. Bourbonnac has a very, uh, very distinctive uh, fresh fruit aroma. Some others that are used, Morved, berry notes, color, color stabilization. Many of the producers making, making reds as well talk about Morved as being um, um, the, the antioxidative wine that's added to the blend. Uh, for some reason, it has, the, it has an effect of taking the hit so that the Grenache in your blend doesn't get overly brown overly quickly. Some of that's inevitable. Grenache has a high, has a high caffeic or acid or caftaric acid content, and it just wants to brown no matter what you do. Syrah, used for color, uh, for uh, top red fruit notes and spice, and also for its tannin contribution. And Carignan, to a lesser extent, but also for color and for warmth. So all of these varieties bring something to the party. It's like having a fresh box of crayons. You get to uh, use which ones you want, as long as you fall within the guidelines of, uh, of the local uh, AOC regulations. So um, the wines of Tavel um, have at their disposal uh, different factors to use for cre creating wines of diversity and complexity. They have, they have uh, multiple juices. They have A's, B's, and C's. Uh, in other words, different renditions of juice hand handling uh, the juice different ways. They have uh, multiple cepage, which ripen in different time zones. Uh, and each deliver a different flavor. And they have uh, multiple terroir. So if you think about all these different factors uh, and, and, and the vintage difference from year to year, you can create, in a wine that's on the simpler side, you can create some real uh, nice interest and diversity. So um, a couple of opinion slides. I think that a, a, a rosé should be dry. In fact, in Tavel, the limit is two grams per liter. Should be balanced, flavor balanced, uh, chemically uh, palate balanced. Uh, it should be delivered when fresh, one to three years. Um, a rosé should be a full service wine, not made out of 19 brick scrapes, but made out of fully ripe grapes, conveying uh, the, 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 the beautiful echo of the red variant of those same grapes used for a red grape during the same zone of ripeness. And uh, should be served year-round. I drink it year-round. I guess it's always warm at my house. <laughs> OK, rosé should not be sweet. Uh, I won't deny uh, my, my Aunt Mildred her sweet rosé, if that's what she wants. But it should not be sweet. It should not be insipid. should not be flat. should not be low alcohol. And it should not be particularly high in tannin. It doesn't have a lot of other extract uh, and, and no sweetness, as we said, to balance with that, uh, that high tannin. So, having covered all those bases, let's taste. You have before you six glasses. Would you like some light? Yeah, you would like some light. Could we bring up the house lights, please? That's okay. We don't want to view dim wines in dim light. Yeah. You have before you uh, six rosés, and uh, I'll tell you that they're, they're all fresh, they're all new, they're all 2005. And I've given you a little spreadsheet showing the varietal mix, just for whatever it's worth, and I've ranked it in, in order of uh, decreasing Grenache percentage. So in other words, the first one is 60, I guess all well, the next three are, are uh, 40. Uh, and, then the, and then 30 and 20. So Grenache is less and less and less dominant as you go down the flight. Uh, and then you can see elements of other things. Uh, some have more or less senso um, and, and other varieties. And I've given you a little, um, a little key to what those varieties are at the bottom. So let's, go, let's spend a few minutes and, uh, and taste. Remember, this is your, your amuse-bouche for the afternoon, your palate cleanser, your uh, interlude. So let's go ahead and taste. I think these are still nice and cold, and uh, we'll talk through them when we're done. These are all, all 05 rosés. I said it that way purposely. Pardon? They could be from anywhere in the world.
there is a Tavel in the there is a Tavel in the mix. Um, sorry, left to right. Left to left is glass one, and the far right glass is glass six. So, uh, pardon me for a moment. I'm going to go taste. Oh, you're done already, huh? <laughs> Doesn't take too long. Lovely, lovely, lovely wines. I am thankful I was able to find so many O5s, so many fresh O5s. Um, these are all from France. Uh, in fact, they're all from a fairly small area in south of France. Um, I don't expect you to be able to pick out the Tavel. Maybe a couple uh, of those among us can pick out the Tavel. No? C'est difficile? Pas facile? <laughs> I would, I would uh, back on that one, too. Um, anyway, just to show you uh, the, the beautiful effect that is uh, called Grenache. It's kind of a, uh, uh, a pre-fermentation, light extraction of some of the nice lighter fruit and uh, tannins that are available in these, in these grape varieties. Um, the yeast doesn't have too much to work with, too much to convert. And as a result, we get, the, we get very nice uh, light uh, cherry juice, raspberry, uh, watermelon, Jolly Rancher, kind of nice, lovely, lovely flavors. The nice thing about Grenache uh, uh, and these other varieties is that they have flavor elements in them that will reach out to a wide variety of things that you're cooking. They have flavor elements that you don't see just sitting here tasting them as wines without food present. And uh, when, you, when you pick up a shrimp or you pick up some cheese or you pick up some... Uh, uh, some grilled vegetables, um, then different flavors just sort of leap out of these wines and make uh, link ingredients or linking flavors or liaison between the wine and the food. Um, any questions about this flat? I'm going to tell you what they are in a minute. Fun? Fun. Kind of nice. Nice palate cleanser for, uh, for the, wine, the heavy wines that are to come. Um, yes, question? Pardon me? Retail, Retail price point. That's going to be on the next uh, next little slide, and I have a handout for you. Actually, any more questions? Make rosé. Anybody who 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 works in a winery? Okay, make rose make rosé. Just make enough of it for you and a few of your friends and customers. Probably Ramy won't make any, but uh, he can come over to my house and drink uh, all he wants. Uh, let me switch over to, a, to an Excel spreadsheet that gives you the idea of all the wines, but uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm passing those out now as well. So the first uh, wine that you tasted was uh, a kind of a classic, well-known Tavel called Canto Perdri. Uh, and, and again, these are all 2005s. Uh, the second one was uh, La Vieille Ferme. Um, which is using a really nice uh, high percentage of Sanso. I think that's uh, uh, maybe one of, the, one of the lovelier wines in the flight. Very delicate, very, very, very light. Uh, the third one is from Les Beaux. Um, the fourth one, uh, Domaine de la Morte Dorée. They also make a Tavel, but it's not here yet. I have to talk to the Tavel vigneron and tell them to get, it, get on the ball. A lot of their neighbors are beating them to market. Uh, very, so many of the Tavels are on their way, but they're not quite here yet. Uh, the fourth one, Le Clos de, de, de Caillou, it's a, is a Côte de Rhone. And the last one, this was a new one on me, Chateau Masneuf, from the region around Nîmes. Price points um, all over the map. Some of them are a little too expensive for a rosé. Some of them are just wonderful. And the only one that came in a screw cap was La Vieille Ferme. I applause for that. Uh, wines one and three used uh, different kinds of synthetic corks. Uh, but I have to say that among wines four, five, and six, all the bottles we opened, luckily nothing was corked. Questions? Okay, that's it. Glad you enjoyed it.
they do um, saigne, but they often go on, go ahead and use um, the rest for a red. But but they also they also make a wonderful wonderful. They're allowed to call rose. Um, they're allowed to make rosé and red and call it Lirac. It's right next door to Tavel. Yeah. There was another question. Yes. General procedure for malolactic fermentation. Um, malolactic fermentation is usually done. Yeah, it's usually done. Uh, I would, if I moved over there, I would probably limit it because I, I would maybe want a little crisper acidity. But these, these wines are delightful. They're, they're very, uh, very tasty, served quite cold. If you uh, barbecue at my house, sometimes I'll even drop an ice cube in at the last minute just for fun. Another question? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I had a slide that I didn't show you. It's on the right bank. Uh, it's an, uh, if you're looking at a map, it's the, it's the left side, as you're looking at a map, of uh, the, the lower Rhone Valley, uh, otherwise referred to as the, the south and southwest. Yeah. It's across the river from Chateauneuf and other places. Yes. Um, it, it, uh, it, it differs. Um, I think that uh, some of the lighter varieties, oh, and, this, and incidentally, there's some whites used, and there's no point in putting those in for Seigne. Uh, and, and I don't really know a percentage. It would, it's up to the individual producer. Um, I think more and more people are, are actually um, crushing to press and using a press hold for their Seigne because it can only last a few hours. Sometimes it'll last overnight, uh, but it's, it's all over the map. You, you couldn't quantify it. Yes? Way back. Way back. Uh, both. Both. Yeah. If things are wide apart, if you have uh, uh, Grenache versus Mourvedre, they're they're weeks apart, so they would be, it would be blunt blended afterwards. A lot of times you need to see how the tannins and color and so forth fall out. I've made rosés where I've had uh, Carignan, Petite Syrah, Syrah, even a little Zinfandel all in the same big tank uh, macerating for several days and the wine, the juice pre-fermentation comes out almost red. Uh, after fermentation, yeast is a marvelous cleansing organism and after fermentation it drops back to the point where you maybe have to blend in a little more color. So, uh, so I, I think more more is done later. Any more? Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I'm I'm glad John overcame his initial reluctance. It was really wonderful to have that talk today. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome.